Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. You'd be wise to do the same, to hold tight to his promises, to his exact words, so that when they come true, your joy overflows. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily, verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the Gospel of John. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. From Jerusalem and the Feast of Passover to the visit with the Samaritans, Jesus' trek has been trending northward, heading back to Galilee where he had been raised, and so that the words of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled in the latter time. He has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. So we pick up today at John chapter 4, beginning at the 43rd verse. After the two days, he departed for Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, to us, your people, your Holy Spirit, and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound, but have free course, and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith they may serve you, and in the confession of your name abide to the end. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's ponder this verse by verse. 43. After the two days he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. At the end of the two days with the citizens of Sychar and bringing them to know and confess that he's the savior of the world, he moves back to home territory, if you will, back to Galilee. And it is curious, isn't it, that John adds the comment, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. How does that fit with the enthusiastic welcome given him when he came back to Galilee by those who had seen the great signs that he had done at the feast, which they also, of course, had attended? Early church theologian Origen, among others, suggested that hometown here actually meant Jerusalem and Judea. And the contrast is then apt between the welcome Jesus receives up north versus the growing opposition he encounters down south in Judea, where, of course, he had been born, though John never mentions the birth in Judea. The same saying, at least as it appears in the other Gospels, however, is associated with his rejection in the town he grew up in, Nazareth. Remember how Nazareth was a stumbling block to Nathaniel. Augustine, though, he thinks it's actually a comment 
looking forward to the fact that the man we're about to hear of only believes truly and finally when he sees the great sign, whereas apparently in Samaria, just hearing the words of Jesus was enough. And Chrysostom, the great 4th century patriarch of Antioch and Constantinople, concurs. The men of Cana received him by reason of the miracles which he had done in Jerusalem and in that place. Not so the Samaritans. They received him through his teaching alone. In that, the Samaritans honored him more than the Galileans, as we shall hear. Verse 46. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When the man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. They may not have had phones and internet, but word still spread. Pilgrims, perhaps, still traveling the way home, shared the news. Jesus, the great wonder worker, was back in Galilee and up in the hills at Cana. Capernaum lay some distance from Cana. Cana up in the hills, Capernaum down at the Sea of Galilee on the northwest shore. So we're talking a fur piece, as they used to say in those days, before modern transport between these two cities, something upwards of 15 hilly miles. But what is distance when someone you love is ill and there is no other place to turn, no other possible help or hope? So the official, maybe a court official of Herod's, a nobleman of some sort, undertakes the journey to Jesus. He goes to him and asks, Come down and heal my son. The boy was at the point of death, and he just wants Jesus to be there. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. The you here is actually plural. Unless y'all see signs and wonders, y'all will not believe. Sort of a strange thing to say to the man, isn't it? Some have taken it that the problem was that the fellow wanted to see with his eyes Jesus worked the sign, the wonder. He didn't at first even consider that Jesus could heal at a distance, that his physical proximity was no limitation to his divine power. I wonder if he was thinking a bit like Naaman was when he first went to Elisha. He had his expectation of what the great prophet would do, but sending him away with only a promise to the water of the Jordan? Well, he found that unacceptable. It's a measure, I think, of the man's depth of anguish, that he doesn't even attempt to argue with Jesus. He rather sweeps away his words without even apparently trying to understand them. Sir, come down before my child dies. The move from Huihas, son, to Padeonmu, my child, carries with it something like we'd hear if a parent pleaded, Lord, please come down before my baby dies. It bespeaks the tenderness of his love and the anguish of his heart. Chrysostom again, as though he could not raise him after death, as though he knew not what the state of the child was. It is for this cause that Christ rebukes him and touches his conscience to show that his miracles were wrought principally for the sake of the soul. For here, He heals the father, sick in mind, no less than the son, in order to persuade us to give heed to him, not by reason of his miracles, but by his teaching. For miracles are not for the faithful, but for the unbelieving and the grosser sort. And yet in the miracle, there is some divine condescension. Cyril of Alexandria, the great North African father, writes, Thus believing, he ought to have come. But Christ does not reject our lack of apprehension. He helps even the stumbling as God. Now, 
what was it that Jesus said to the man? I really do try not to criticize too much our English Standard Version, but this is one passage where it just drives me up the wall. Jesus did most certainly not say, go, your son will live. He said, go, your son lives. Not future, present tense. And you'll see why that matters in a little bit. So the man believes the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he goes on his way. Franzman, the great poet and hymn writer, he said that the man went home with only a word in his pocket. I want you to put yourself into that man's head and heart for a few moments. What's the devil whispering in his ear? Isn't it something along these lines? Big guy too busy to bother with the likes of you, huh? Sends you off to face the kid's death alone. Doesn't care enough to do what you asked. Couldn't interrupt his busy schedule to come down with you, not even if it meant saving your son's life. But since we're told the man believed the words of Jesus, he would no doubt battle that with, No, be silent. He said, your son lives. Satan's like, yeah, that and five shekels might buy you a coffee at the downtown cafe. He would reply, Jesus said, your son lives. I'm holding to that. And so back and forth, all the way home. He wasn't made of different stuff than you and me. He knew this battle. It's what the Lutheran confessions actually describe in one place as true worship. That is, the exercises of faith as it wrestles with despair. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. And as he was going down, we realize from the conversation here that the man had apparently traveled during the night to get back to his boy now that he had the promise of Jesus. But here's a mercy of God already. Instead of letting him stew all the way, messengers have come in search of him with good news. And what did they tell him? Ack, wrong again. Most certainly, they did not say that his son was recovering. It's far sweeter than that. Literally, they greet him with Jesus' own verb tense. Your child lives! And so, of course, he wanted to know when the turning happened. And they tell him right at the seventh hour yesterday, the precise moment Jesus had promised, your son lives. And he knows. Jesus' word did what Jesus promised, reaching across those many miles. He was right to hold tight to the words of Jesus in the battle against the nagging unbelief of Satan. You'd be wise to do the same, to hold tight to his promises, to his exact words, so that when they come true, your joy overflows. And the man believed, and so did all his household, which can only mean that he immediately spilled the beans about what had happened. John calls this healing from a distance by the word and promise of Christ, the great sign Jesus did after coming from Judea to Galilee. And it just happened in the exact same place that the first sign took place, Cana of Galilee. Till next time, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. For any size gift by the end of 2019, we'll send you an autographed copy of Pastor Whedon's devotional book, Celebrating the Saints. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. 
You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.